Hey everyone, it is Hera, and I am so excited to be working with Spotify this month to promote their new platform, Spotify for Podcasters, which is a platform from Spotify that makes it super easy to start your own podcast. It allows you to edit and record from your phone or computer while also monetizing it and having fun features such as video podcasts and Q&A to interact better with your listeners. One of the best parts about this platform is that Spotify distributes your podcast for you everywhere, so it takes a lot of the hard work off your shoulders. So if you're interested, go download Spotify for podcasters. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I hope you guys are doing amazing. Welcome to another super, super big episode. I'm going to try to do this an hour or under, but there might be a part two or I might exceed an hour. We'll find out. So this episode is going to talk about all the different life lessons that I've learned dealing with all sorts of people of all ages, of all times of my life, whether they're in my life or they're gone. Um, and you know, this idea is really weird because like I've never seen anybody like talk about like the life lessons that they've learned specifically dealing with people. And I think one of the reasons why is because it can be a little bit messy. And I feel like for me personally, I'm going to be very blatantly honest. I've had to learn certain lessons in my life multiple times. Like, not just a one-hit wonder. Like, no, I've had to learn some lessons in my life multiple times. And I really just want to say in the beginning of this episode, like, don't don't get yourself in a twist. Like, I I don't care to shade people. I don't care to, you know, do any of that. Um, That's not my intention. I think that the reason why this idea hit me is because one night I was sitting there. I, like, fudge your time. And I was thinking about how so many of our life experiences are revolved around people. And I was thinking about how so many things I've learned, I've learned from people. Whether that's, you know, good or bad, whether that's from people and the way they behave to me or things that they've taught me, right? And whenever we say like life lessons that you learn from people, people automatically think of negative things, like bad things. And that's not always the case. I've learned some very, very, very beautiful things from the people around me. And I feel like for me personally, I value everyone in my life, whether they're here, whether they've left, because at some point they've taught me something. And I feel like it's a really, I feel like a lot of people say this, but it's really hard to internalize it. And I think I'm just like any other human being. So of course, at times it is hard for me to internalize things like that. But especially the things that I'm going to talk about right now are things that have happened to me years and years ago, um, for the most part, and things that has just been done, said, done over. Like, it's not personal. It's not one-on-one to somebody. It's not, like, anything like that. This is just general life lessons that I've learned from people, whether they've told me this or I've learned from their behavior. This is not, you know, all that in a bag of chips and some tea. It's just life lessons. And the reason why I feel like this is so important, I remember one point in my life, And I always tell people, like, when I was really depressed, I used to isolate myself. And I was depressed for a good few years. This was a while ago. And I remember that there was a hadith that I came across in that time that said, The Prophet, peace be be upon him, said, The believer who mixes with people and is patient with their harm has a greater reward than the believer who does not mix with people, nor is patient with their harm. And this hadith is one of my favorites, and it always just kind of, like, comes in my mind when I get in a moment where I'm like, Man, I just don't want to be dealing with nobody anymore. Because I feel like we've all come to that point in life, and if you haven't, you will soon, like, where you're just so tired. You're tired of people, you're tired of getting hurt, you're tired of feeling, you know, like you're not being valued or treated correctly, or you just, you're tired of feeling negative emotions, or you're just tired as a whole, and you feel like it requires so much social battery energy. Like, at times, I feel like there's a lot of different factors, each for every, each to their own, and I think that this had these always kind of, like, brought me back and reminded me that, like, I can isolate my doors and shut my doors and, you know, never have to deal with a human being again, or never have to deal with a similar emotion of hurt or heartbreak or sadness or crying or betrayal or disloyalty or cheating or like I can I can shut my walls and make sure I never feel those emotions again but if I'm meant to feel them I'm meant to feel them and if I think that me surrounding myself shutting all my doors living in the four walls of my room is going to protect me it's not because to some degree if something's meant for me to happen something's meant for me to feel it's going to happen and so I feel like I try my best now I feel like everyone can say this like I'm a really big extrovert like now of course things have changed over the years after I got out of my depression and I'm like I love to talk I love to be with people I love to meet people and so for me like I view every person as of course a valuable human being whether they're in my life or not but as something that I learned something from you I'm not going to you know throw dirt on your face. I know a lot of people who are really, really messy and dirty in matters of people that have left their life. And I feel like this is my first life lesson, actually. 
Um, this is just like kind of an intro by my first one because it just fits so perfectly. I think that one of the things I learned in life is that in everyone's story, you might be an enemy or you might be a hero and there might be your enemy or they might be your hero. And if you happen to be the villain or the enemy and you feel like from your side you weren't, there's not a lot that you can always do to change that, okay? Memories that are shared by everybody serve the holder different. I remember I once read this quote, I think it was on Twitter, it said memories... Um, held by everybody serves the holder different so the way that I might perceive the way you treated me might have been different than the way you perceived it you might have thought that you did something to show me love I might have felt hurt and that's what I'm saying you might have had a situation a conflict or whatever let's say with your parents let's say with your family let's say with your siblings you and your siblings had a discourse had an argument had something that went on you saw that matter as something insulting and offensive and something that really like distanced you apart from them. Your siblings saw it as a matter of we're just talking, right? Like I know for me, on a personal level, me and my sister were very, very different. We're not alike at all. And anytime people see us in public, they're like, okay, so whose daughter are you and whose daughter are you? Like, we don't look alike at all. And there's been so many times we went to like family dawits and stuff, like family friend dawits. And they were like, okay, so you're like, you know, my mom's daughter, who is she? And I'm like, oh my God, no, like we're both sisters. And not only do we look really different, we act very different. And so my sister is a very, very like lighthearted, like she doesn't take things too seriously type of person. You know, she might say something and then she'll be like, well, it wasn't that big of a deal. I, on the other hand, I'm really like emotional and I listen, and I'm like, if you say something like I'm going to remember it type person, she's like, you said it's gone out of my ear. Like, you know what I'm saying? And all sisters, all siblings, like we all kind of fight. You fight for 10 minutes and then like y'all are talking again. It's normal, right? And I feel like sometimes I'm the type of person that takes it way too deep. And she's just like, what are you talking about? What happened? You know what I'm saying? So it's like everybody has a different dynamic with the way that they perceive things. Now, of course, not talking about my sister because nothing like this has ever happened between us but in bigger situations like dealing with somebody who might have hurt you or dealing with how your parents might have shoved you in a position you know I knew a friend whose parents like forced and like I'm not saying like lightly forced like I mean like forced from like elementary and on to this pathway of her getting this specific college degree that she didn't want to do and I'm not talking like oh she got into like college and her family was like you're gonna do this no like she graduated from elementary school I know this sounds so far back <laughs> she graduated from elementary school right she went to elementary and after that her parents well her parents mashallah they do a good job raising um her and her siblings their home school they've done Islamic school a lot of different stuff but they've specifically started to put her on a line of getting more classes and education and homeschool and online learning um towards that specific career path whether that was like little elective courses or like little workshops for that thing like they instilled it in her mind from a young age like this is what you're gonna do and when high school came around it was like well forced like they put her on that track and then when college came it was inevitable unsaid that you're gonna get this degree and now that she's like nearly done with her degree me and her talk sometimes and she says to me I like I hate it I can't imagine a day in my life working as this and what I always tell her is like I agree with that but when we come to a point where we're this much halfway done it's just about finishing it and then asking yourself, what are you going to do with your own future? That's the way that I see it. I feel like I'm pretty practical about some things. I feel like some people, like, you know, you're in your last semester of college, last, you know, whatever of college and everybody's like, and you decide you don't want to do it. People are like, oh, yeah, just chase your dreams and leave it. Well, I feel like sometimes it's practical to just go through with it. Just finish off the next six months. And then the discussion comes after that of what do you want to do? And that's something that I always tell my friend. I'm like, we can't go back in time now and change this path that your parents put you on. But what we can do is decide what you want to do after graduation. Whether that's you want to work in a specific field with this degree or you don't. Or you want to go com some, somewhere completely different, right? Like, that's your decision. And we can't, we can't do much about it now. Like, if you want to run away halfway now when you're literally about to be done, when you're about to walk across the stage, I mean, go ahead. But is that really a good, like, is that really a good decision? And so I feel like some people might say yes. Some people might say no. We all view things differently. But what my point of sharing this is that that memory holds different for her and her parents. She sees it as her parents putting their opinion on her, pressurizing her, forcing her, feeling like she's trapped and has no option. And her parents see it as we're putting her on the right path. We're getting her a good career. We're making her stable. We're making sure she doesn't have to depend on anybody. We're setting her up for future. And again, the moral is... 
we all hold it differently. Now, when it comes to a bigger example, I might be the villain in somebody's story. I can't change that. You know what I'm saying? When I was younger, I would go crazy to change that. And I had. Like, I remember, this was years and years and years ago, like six, seven years ago. Like, if I was ever the villain in anybody's story, anyone ever told me that I even harmed them in any way, by doing what simply was best for me, whether that was emotionally best for me, whether that was leaving something, that was the emotional best decision for me. Like, putting myself first. When I made decisions that required me to put myself first and someone told me that it hurt them or I was the villain in their story because of that, I used to go berserk and I used to want to do everything to unchange that, to like, you know, rewrite the story and to be the good person. But sometimes you're not going to be the good person in everybody's story and it, you're better off accepting this now more than later, right? Like, and that's what I always tell people. I know that I have a lot of people that are listening that are really, really young. Like, I have some girls that are listening that are like 12 and 13. And like, as you grow older, as a preteen and as a teenager, and just you grow up, especially as a girl, you're going to be made the villain in a lot of people's stories. A lot. You might be seen, you might be portrayed, you might be even framed as a villain in some stories where you did not do anything wrong. I know some people whose parents have literally told their kids that they're the villain and they're the problem and you know, da-da-da-da-da. It's like, in some places, in some situations, and maybe in some stories, and some chapters for some people, you will be the villain. We don't control that, Right? Now, of course, that doesn't mean to act like a villain or do villain things. That doesn't mean to break somebody's heart or be, you know, disloyal or be betrayal. Like, nobody says to do those things. But if you decide that, like, look, this is not right for me. This is not good for me. Or emotionally, I feel like I'm. this is not fit for me no more. And you decide that you want to leave something. Or you decide that, okay, I don't want to do this decision because it doesn't make me happy. And it won't make me happy long term. You're not, you're not an evil villain for leaving. You're not a villain for being out of it you know what I'm saying now someone might view you as that but you know that you had to be the hero in your own story and save yourself and that's kind of what it all comes down to again there's a difference between actually being a villain and being portrayed as a villain in somebody's story we don't control the way people see us okay we don't control the way people see us we don't control the way that people think about us we don't control the way that people perceive our actions the only thing we control is us okay so it's my job to make sure that I don't hurt you It's my job to make sure that I don't cause any feelings of betrayal or mistrust in you. It's my job to make sure that I take care of you in whatever relationship we have. But if in some way you feel like I have harmed you or I have hurt you, then I, of course, will try my best to take accountability and fix it and look at that. But then there's some situations where people have already made up their mind, which is why I am a type of person that I don't like to just go snap on make my own mind and fill in the story and that's one thing that I worked very very hard on myself to do which I'll actually make lesson number two don't fill in the story for things you don't know because you're gonna create your own perception your own plot line of things that might or might not have happened and it's gonna make you formulate your own opinions on this person or your own opinions on the situation which quite often lead to more damage okay which quite often make you villainize somebody more and that's why i feel like it's important to understand all sides of the story yes and also understand and come to a level that you understand that like you feel this way about me and i feel this way about you and this is what actually happened nobody is lying i'm not a liar because i said that i feel hurt you're not a liar because you say that you think i'm the villain right and the truth is the truth the way that we all see truth is different, right? We see that in religion. We see that in everything. The way that me and you perceive truth is different, right? Like the way that I see truth as Islam being the truth is different than the way someone who's not Muslim might see truth. The way that I see truth in my relationship with you is different than the way you see truth in my relationship with me, whatever it might be. You know what I'm saying? Like vice versa. The way we see things are different. We're not the same. We don't have the same pair of eyes. We don't have the same pair of brain. We don't interpret things the same way. We view things differently. But... It's important that in this process, of course, you are as most gentle and as kind as you can be because the only thing you can control is yourself and you have to make sure that you are not the one harming. You are not the one doing anything wrong. Now, if putting yourself first and doing certain decisions in a nice way, not in a way that's a complete, you know, I don't even want to like, I I want to find the right word for it. Um, In a complete crappy way, I guess, I guess that's the most lightest word I can use. If putting yourself first requires you to do it, 
extraordinarily crappy decisions that you know is going to ruin somebody's life and make them feel betrayed and disloyal and da, 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 then that's a problem like you need to figure out the way that you're going to go about things you know like it's it's all a level of balance some way sometimes there's no way but the hard way and sometimes there's no way but this way like sometimes we can negotiate sometimes we can find a middle path on how we want to go about things but sometimes things have to be done the way, the way they have to be done right and so my way your way you know, the truth or how we view things, it's different for everybody. I know some people who like genuinely, and I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, I have some friends, alhamdulillah, 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 I'm gonna keep it this way, family, whoever. Like I know people that love me. And then I know people that hate me. And it's such a stark, like it's so, it's so heavy on both sides. It's never been neutral. I've noticed I'm rarely a neutral person. You either love me or you either hate me. And majority of the time, if people hate me, they hate me because I say the things that they low-key don't want people to be saying or I'm too outspoken. And I've, I've noticed and actually have heard that quite a few times, but that's a story for another day. Anywho, so I feel like there's no, there's no in between, right? Like, and I feel like for me personally... I try my best to be there for everybody, right? I try my best to be available and helpful for everybody. And I feel like it, it takes a lot, in my opinion, for me to kind of look at you and be like, I want nothing to do with you. I want to dissociate you from you or I don't like you, right? Because even just the words like, I don't like, I don't like to use that for people. Like, I don't like to say, I don't like blank. I don't like blank. I hate blank. Like, I feel like those are strong words. I don't like to do that. I'd rather just dissociate. So I feel like it takes a lot for me to come to that point, especially since I don't like to you know, fill in my own stories or villainize somebody because it's convenient. Like, I like to be pretty, pretty level-headed in all situations to my best degree, or at least be fair and be understanding, be very understanding. I think sometimes I'm too understanding and that's a problem. That's another thing I'm going to say as my third life lesson, okay? Controversial. Sometimes you have got to not be so understanding, okay? Now, I'm going to bite my tongue before you jump and let me explain why. I have a PhD in being overly understanding and I can tell you that a lot of times in my life if I ever gotten hurt a lot of it was my own fault in being overly understanding and overly forgiving. Now here's where I'll create a difference. I believe that you should always be forgiving. I have not really had a hard time in my life forgiving people unless it was very severe. And I feel like I've faced very, very severe situations in my life where it was incredibly hard, like detrimentally hard for me to forgive people probably three times in my entire life, okay? I know some people who like every single encounter like that is just, mm, it icks them, it irks them. They're like, I can't forgive you. I'm a very forgiving person. Like you have, like you can just, you can do anything and I'll be like, hmm. I'll forgive. But like, I think three times in my entire life, and I remember them very distinctly, was when I had the hardest time forgiving. And one of those times was pretty recent. And so it's very, very hard for me when it comes to that point, because I also know me, right? Like, I think just like you might know you better than anybody. If you're a very forgiving person, and out of nowhere, you're having a really hard time forgiving, no offense, you know that something went on Something went down that brought you to that point, especially if you're someone that's really forgiving and not nitpicky. And so for me, I feel like I had a really hard time forgiving three times in my life in three very big situations. And what I learned is you always want to settle emotional debt on this world because you don't want to deal with it in the ahirat. And only one time in my life, only one time of those three times, only one of those times, did I ever think to myself, like, wow, like, is Allah going to be just about this situation with me? Like, what, what, what's going to happen? Like, because I want justice. Only one time in my life. And mind you, I've been done wrong a lot of times in my life. <laughs> I've, done, I've been done wrong a lot of times in my life. But I, I've never let it get to me to a point where I'm like, I'm going to turn bitter. I'm not going to forgive you. I'm going to be a negative Nancy and I'm going to hold a grudge and put up my walls. And I've never, I never let those things change me because i think that one of the most beautiful things in everybody is like their spark and who they are and like i never want to lose that or give that up because of somebody but only one time of those three times in my life did i ever sit there and i thought to myself like i want allah's justice to come and i was really hurt i was really hurt it was a really hard time and 
now I think about that situation. And I just think about, you know, the way that I feel. And I'm like, I genuinely do make good dua for those people. I make good dua for those situations. Um, like I said, like I've been done dirty quite a few times in my life. But three times in my entire life was when it got really detrimental where I was like, wow, like, mm, that was messed up. And when I look back at the at the steps that brought us here, a lot of times it was because I was too understanding. I feel like one of the big things that I would always tell people, especially as a girl, is that you can be understanding and you can be forgiving. But that doesn't mean you always have to give people more chances to be in your life. You know, I feel like a lot of times when we're like, oh yeah, I forgive you, but you don't have to, you can't come back in my life. It seems a little mean. It seems a little harsh. But now that I'm older, I'm like, mm -mm. it's just a boundary. It's a barrier. And if you don't set up a boundary or barrier, people will run you over and eat you up. And that's just that. So at times, yes, you do have to have a boundary. You do have to be a little bit stern. And let's say somebody hurts you and they apologize and you set up a boundary and you're like, you can't come back in my life again. I forgive you, but I want nothing to do with you. They might villainize you. They might villainize you and make you the villain in the story and be like, oh, it was you. You're the problem. I know a lot of people that went through that. <laughs> again, memories shared by everybody holds everybody different. You know why you did it. You did it to protect yourself. They might have felt different ways, whatever. Like, I just feel like, in some situations, it's better to not be overly understanding. Now, needless to say, I know that right now, I feel like in my opinion, if I was to say a general trend, I think us as people right now are very under understanding. Like we don't want to understand people. We constantly want to jump the gun. We constantly want to, you know, be very, be very nitpicky, over assumption-y, other ease. Like you just really want to be, you know, really just like all about you, 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 you. And I don't agree with that. I think that there are certain situations where you should be understanding. But at one point or another, you have to look and think, is the fact that I'm being really over understanding something that this person might be using to manipulate me with? Because that happens. It happens very often. Where sometimes if you're a really understanding person, people might use that to manipulate you. I don't really like to throw the word manipulating and toxic around like that. But people might use that to control you. And they might do crappy things and say, well, you should understand my point of view. Well, you should understand mine. Okay? Sometimes you got to be like, well, you should understand mine. And peace out. Because life is short. You got to take care of yourself. You might be made the villain. But if that means you get to be the hero in your own story, it's worth it. Next lesson I'm going to tell you. Some people might be good people to their people. But they're, they might not be good people to you and your people. So... That doesn't mean you force them to be good, okay? Now, let me explain this. So, a lot of times, I've seen this happen, you know, in not really with me and my family, but I've seen this happen with one of my closest friends. I've seen this happen with a lot of people where, you know, they might have relatives, they might have their own family members, which are really good people, distant family members, cousins, whoever, might be really good people, okay? Good people. They pray, they're religious, they're just mm, A+. Plus. And the way they treat other people is good. But the way they treat them is poor. The way they talk to them is poor. The way they act towards them is poor. And that's the problem. And so I have seen, I've seen some of my own friends and their families. And I've just heard of so many different situations, even from you guys. Like when my listeners tell me stuff where they've chased and chased and chased and chased good people. Questioning why these good people aren't being good to them. And the thing is, and I said this before, my, it was my, um, who said this? <laughs> my brain's blinking. I think it was my mom's dad. And my mom always says this now. My mom always mentions this. She says that people aren't bad. It's the relationship we have with them that is. It was among those lines. And I always remember that now because you can be with some good people, but the relationship you have with them is bad. And this comes back again to number one. Like you can be the villain. They can be the hero. We don't control how people see things. But at the core of it all, it's really, really important to remember that like if somebody's a good person, but they're not good to you, you know, don't do not do a whole brain dissection, life dissection, psychology dissection, psychoanalyze the situation and be like, why are they just not good to me? Don't take it personal and be like, is it about me? Am I not worthy enough? Am I not good enough? Am I, am I not pretty enough? Mm -mm, don't think like that. Um, what it comes down to is the fact that sometimes it's, it's like clear as day, right? Like sometimes it's very simple. 
They might be a good person. They might treat other people good. But maybe you and them, their relationship is not good. Or maybe the way they treat you is not good. And that can happen for various reasons, right? Everybody has red flags. Everybody's a little bit toxic. Everybody has some issues, right? And if you think you don't, that's yours right there. So everybody has some problems, right? And it could be that maybe those problems come out a lot more when they're with you. That doesn't mean you have to put up with them right? A lot of times I know women, this is, this is sad because this is not something that happened. Like this is not a far distant story. I know this person like firsthand almost. And it's just, mm, I don't, I don't, I don't like to think about it, but I know some women who have lived and are currently in like marriages that are not good. Like I know some that have left abusive marriages. I know some that are not in abusive marriages, but they're just in loveless marriages, like loveless, like there's nothing more to it. Right. And they just feel like, well, look, he's such a good guy and the way he treats his family and the way that he treats, you know, his community and da 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 Like, he's a good guy, but he's not good to you. Like, I know some women that got abused. And now, alhamdulillah, they're out of it. But they were like, but he was so good and he was so, like, well off. And so, like, in public, like, everybody used to see him and compliment him. But I'm like, but when he used to come home, how he used to treat you and what he used to do with you is all that matters. And that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what other people think of somebody, Right? Because that's not what's going to make your relationship with them. For example, let's say, you know, you have a friend and everybody loves this friend. Everybody says this friend is the best friend. You know, she's flawless. She's just mm, A1, top 10. Like she's just perfect, right? This friend, everybody loves her. But that way that that friend treats you isn't good. You know, that friend might gaslight you. She might say rude things. She might be really condescending. She might, you know, she might put you down in like, weird ways that affect you or she might just be very blatantly rude and gossip and hurt you and just drama like she might not be a good person but everybody on the outside loves her and so you start to kind of get a little bit trippy about it and you're like well why does everyone like her why does everyone see something good in her she isn't good to me i don't see it everybody says she's kind she's caring and she's loving but she isn't kind or caring or loving to me she's mean she puts me down she gossips about me she isn't any of those things but then you stick around and you deal with it because you're like well everyone else sees it there has to be something there the collective image doesn't always mean that's how the individual image is going to be okay so write that down put on your forehead if you need to the collective image doesn't always mean that the individual image is going to look like that just because someone collectively in public, in community, in your wherever has a really good image does not necessarily mean that your interaction one-on-one -on -one with, with them is going to be like that. And that goes the same with bad people. Some people have a really bad image. Maybe they've gotten slandered on for things that aren't even their fault. And when you get to know them, they're great people. So we can't just go off of big collective community images, right? I know people who have, again, been there, seen there, done that. And we even see this in the life of the prophet, peace be upon him, how he, so many people didn't like him. So many people thought that he was a sorcerer, he was a magician, he was doing this, he was doing that. So many people just thought so poorly about him. But if we went based off the collective image, things would be very different today. But clearly it wasn't that. The prophet, peace be upon him, on who he was as an individual, was beyond what they said. He was chosen by Allah. And so it's like, if you, if you just constantly go off of this collectiveness on even your day-to-day -day people, it's mm -mm, mm -mm, not good. The next thing I'm going to tell you on a lighthearted note, everyone has a different way of feeling loved and cared and valued for. And I think that if you are serious in any relationship or friendship or family relationship, it's your job to figure that out. Right. I think it is. Um, I think that there's some things that obviously could be blatantly said like, oh, I feel the most loved and valued and cared when you do this for me or when, you know, you understand me this way or you know like there's some things that we can say and then there's some things that are unspoken and like unsaid right and that's what you learn i think that the most beautiful thing about relationships with anybody with your family your friends um i i especially believe with your family is that you get the chance to learn about this person to know this person especially in your family and i'll tell you why i think i've talked about this before but a lot of times people make this mistake where they just view their family as their family so like that's my mom that's my dad that's my sister that's my brother but they don't actually take time to learn about their family like who is my mom outside of the role of her being my mom like who is she really have you ever thought about that like have you thought about your mom and been like who is she you know what does she like to do? What does she not like? What makes her feel appreciated? It's not just she's my mom and she wants me to wash the dishes and that makes her happy. Or that's my dad and he likes when I do this. Like, no, like, 
every single person and i feel like when you're with your family since you live with them you know so much about them but at the same time you don't know some things and i feel like it's interesting to learn those things and i think in any meaningful friendship with you know your friends like i know one of, one of my friends i actually have two friends that are like this that were really introverted like i mean like so introverted that it was beyond the walls like it, i've never met such big introverts before and i think it took me a year almost to warm up with both of them and i i love them and now we're so close we do the most stupidest things together and they just they're super chatty with me but it wasn't like that it took such a long time and it happened through like little things through little jokes, through little things that I remembered, through little things they remembered, through little things that kept us mutually connected, little efforts, like little things that make them happy, little things that make them smile, little things that made them excited. And I think that any person who's serious about creating a good relationship, a meaningful relationship, is going to take the time out to figure out those unsaid unspoken things that make you feel valued and loved and happy that make you feel those things right like again with your family like for me for example shoot what is mine i don't even know like i'm just i'm running on one brain cell right now like let me give you an example of somebody else because get somebody else to do it like one of my friends okay she has a saying where she loves when i text her like good morning in the morning like it has to be in the morning okay it can't be like at 12 p.m she's like oh really good afternoon now what's the point like she's she's a little petty about that but she likes when i text her good morning okay i have one specific friend that just loves when i video call like i can't audio call her i can't just phone call she's like no like video call me like she just loves that and i want that over time i have one friend who loves when i make this one specific food for her and she never asks me to make it for her i just make it for her to make her day and it makes her really happy i have some friends that just like to have certain jokes and do certain things together and i'll do those things if they make them happy the same way they do things that make me happy right like it's mutual on all sides i like to do things that make people i love happy and you know it, i'm not saying that you gotta do things that you detrimentally hate that you just you know don't enjoy like for example if i do the dishes that probably makes my mom happy will i do the dishes sure do i enjoy doing the dishes i'm just okay like i'll do them i don't hate them i'm not an enemy to the dishes i don't love them you know like oh, okay it's fine i'll do it you know what i'm saying there's been times when my mom has said to me like hey here can you do this can you do that i'm just like Ugh. okay and maybe i don't enjoy doing those things okay like but it's fine because i'll do it because i know my make her happy and same thing goes with little things like I know with my sister, she loves to talk and she just likes when someone listens to her. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you remember and notice these little things about people, um, of course, people that are also doing it for you, like a good, healthy relationship and you want to build on your healthy, your current healthy relationship, or you want to form a new healthy relationship, focus on the things that are said, but also focus on the things that are unsaid that makes this person feel valued. Because when you make someone feel valued, you remember what they said, you remember how they feel, like that, that makes them feel like you're involved in the relationship, right? And I think it's important to do that in general. I think that's a basic necessity. I think it's, no offense, sometimes I think it's the bare minimum in some, some relationships, right? Like with your partner, like it's just, I'm sorry, it's kind of like the bare minimum. Like it is, you should know those things, right? But all in all, I think it can make someone feel more secured. And I think that's one of the really most important things, um, which is going to be my next lesson. But before I move on to my next thing, if you don't know already, now you do, that this episode is sponsored by Rabatha. Y'all know that I don't promote things really often on my podcast, but I did work with them last school year. I'm working with them again this school year to tell you guys that their fall 2024 semester registration for the Rabat Academic Institution is open right now as we speak. The Rabat Academic Institution provides a wide range of courses for women to take on traditional Islamic knowledge for women, by women, all online, which is honestly one of the best things. Like I always say that as a girl, I think there's a different level of connection and learning and questions that you're able to ask and do when it's a female scholar. And one of the best parts is that all their courses are taught by female scholars 
whatever it might be. So I think that's really beneficial as a girl. I remember I did an episode where one of their amazing scholars came on and talked about the fic of menstruation. And I feel like these type of topics are so important to talk about. And I think it's just important in general as a girl to learn from female scholars because it's a different level of connection for sure. All classes are held online. The recordings are posted after class. And like I always say, they have over 50 courses from like Sira, Tajweed, and Fik and Hadith. And then they always have like different little fun courses that I love. They have the 99 names of Allah, Reflections on the Quran, Lessons from the Life of the Prophet, Rulings of Fasting and Prayer, Tajweed. Then they have their Arabic levels as well, their Quran memorization courses, all these other fun things to help you build a deeper relationship with the Quran. I love their little fun courses as well that they offer. It really kind of helps you with your relationship with Allah and just kind of getting that next level within yourself. And like always, all of their courses are affordable and there is a country discount and scholarship available. So visit rabata.info slash Islamic feelings. You can register today. I have their link in this podcast bio. I have it on my link tree. If you have any questions, feel free to DM me and we'll be happy to help. With that being said, I also encourage a lot of people to make sure that you listen to some of those episodes that I have with those scholars from Rabata that came on and answered y'all's questions. A lot of those topics and those episodes that I do with our scholars from Rabata are topics that you guys have requested, whether that's fic of menstruation and how do we figure out, you know, when am I done with my period? When should I pray? When should I not? Those things, um, whether it even comes to like, why are we tested in this life? What can we understand? I did one with Dr. Tamara Gray, which was on love and Islam. That was actually my most listened to episode of 2023. 409%. Y'all like, it was wholesome. It was really wholesome. But like I said, I always get messages in my Discord, in my Instagram. I get these messages really frequently asking where I'd recommend to learn Quran, Tajweed, Arabic, or just courses in general from and i always recommend rabata to people because of their levels especially i think their levels are very reasonable with the way that they level everybody off you don't feel like you're getting jumbled up in one place where you don't belong you don't feel like it's just one random tajweed course and we're all here and either it feels too fast or it feels too slow they do group sessions and they have one-on-one sessions if you have any questions feel free to dm me i can send you a bunch of information on their classes so inshallah go sign up for that now the next thing i was going to mention on our topic security and comfort i believe yeah security and comfort and trust are the most valuable most expensive and most detrimental things in every relationship and let me explain why of course you guys have heard you know no trust equals just playing games um no trust and it's just constantly problems and i'm telling you from somebody who I never really had too many trust issues. And then I feel like as I got older, my trust issues got bad. And then for like a solid time in my life, my trust issues needed rehab. Like, I just, it was horrendous. Now, I'm gonna be honest. My trust issues, like, I'm very honest. I don't like to act like I'm perfect in my areas. My trust issues now, they're just... There is there. Like, I'm just like, you know, like there's some things that I can change and I can control and work on when it comes to my trust issues. And then there's some fears and insecurities that I might have um, about getting hurt or about, you know, being betrayed or getting, you know, dealing with disloyal people, etc. That are going to get better over time. Now, I'm not saying to take every single one of your problems or your trust issues and constantly self-sabotage or ruin every relationship. Like for me, even though I might have trust issues, I always give people chances. I always trust, I always try my best to trust people. I always try my best to, you know, like give somebody the space. And the way that I go about all my relationships really is that the first time around, I'm going to trust you. Okay, I'm going to trust you. I, I'm a firm believer in trust until there's no reason not to, right? And then if you show me a reason not to, like, that I'm just gonna be like, mm, okay, you, you messed it up. Good job. You messed it up. So it's one of those things. And it's not something that I can change, right? There's some people that you're like, you know, some people are like really forgiving and like, and I am forgiving too. But when it comes to like trust issues, like you can like do them really dirty and they'll be like, oh, it's okay. I'll still trust you. And they'll still 100% blindly trust somebody again. And like, that's just not me, right? Like I can forgive you, but that doesn't mean I'm a trustee. You're gonna have to earn your trust. And if you can't earn your trust and you fail again, then clearly you're not deserving of my trust. It's simple as that, right? Because for me, I value trust and loyalty as one of the most hardest things. And when you leave somebody in a hard time or you dock somebody out or you push somebody else to face consequences and run away on your own, or you just are disloyal, you're a cheater, or you're just, you know, not with the well intentions, why should I trust you? It's simple as that. Like, people might hear that and try to villainize me for it. But why? Why? 
would you trust me if I did some of those things? Like, would you trust me if I was a disloyal person, if I backstabbed you, if I cheated on you, if I harmed you? Would you trust me? I hope you wouldn't trust me. I hope you wouldn't. And that's what I'm saying. Like, some of y'all want to make trust such a one-way street that, oh my god, you have to earn my trust. You have to do things for my trust. I view trust as a two-way street. You trust me, I'll trust you. Now, if you do something to mess up my trust, I will be very open and honest about that, that I don't trust you anymore. Um, and if you want to try your best to earn that trust, I am, I'm willing to work on it with you. But I'm not going to just 100% give it out for free like that again. It's not going to happen. And I feel like one of the things that... Okay, this is about to get dark. But one of the things that I think that really got destroyed in me in a lot of relationships was trust. And it, I feel like it's one of those things that I don't know... I don't know like why that is I don't know because it's like one of those things where like I genuinely don't say this to sound like arrogant but I don't know anybody who's more loyal and trustworthy and sincere than myself and it sucks because you know when people say that and it's just like it sounds so arrogant but it's like I'm just saying the truth like I'm the type of person that like I'm always down like we can be going through the worst things and I'll be there but I've rarely had that for me and so I feel like a common theme in my life is like, it takes a lot for me to be like, okay, I'm done with somebody, right? Like whether that's in a friendship, whatever, like, it takes a lot for me to be like, I'm distancing myself from you. And I think one of the things that it just constantly seems to be is disloyalty and trust issues and trust stuff. Because it's like when people play messy or people want to dock somebody else, throw somebody else in the fire to save their own selves. Like I'm just not about that life because it's just, I'm not. And it's one of those things that like you just can't it's not gonna go it's not gonna go like if you do something like that there's just no second chances and it sucks because a lot of times it leaves you pretty lonely but it's also something that has to be done and it also kind of sucks because i remember one time i was talking to somebody and i was i, I actually once talked to a scholar about this because i was dead in my feelings i was like bro i'm so loyal to everybody like, I will, I wish well for everybody. What's going on here? Why? Like, why do I keep going through things like this? And I remember that it was one of those days where this same hadith that I mentioned in the beginning came into my brain. And I was like, you know, like, sometimes we go through things or we deal with people that might really hurt us or harm us and da 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 da. But it's one of those things that over time gets better. It does get better. Have I seen better yet? I'm going to be honest. No. But do I think it gets better? Yes. Because I know who Allah is. And so I always believe that like every disloyalty, every trust issue, every person that's harmed you is just bringing you one step closer to something and someone way better. And so I, maybe someone might say I'm Delulu for that one. <laughs> maybe someone might think I'm Delulu for that one. It's fine. I just, I feel like the way that I see it though is how I see all tough times in life, right? one step closer to getting better and that's that that's that vibes that's that and so one thing that i will tell anybody who's struggling with trust issues or might have been like you know just like you have a hard time trusting somebody it's this okay you can't control what people do and you can't control whether someone's loyal to you or whether they're trustworthy or not, right? You just have to trust that if they harm you and if they're disloyal to you, you'll get out of it. That's all that matters. You don't have to trust that people won't hurt you. You just have to trust that if they do, you'll learn how to get out of it and you'll be okay. And from somebody who's been through it quite a few times, whether that was in family, friends, whatever, whatever relationships... Um, even some of them, the very, very closest people that I thought were like sisters to me, mm, it happened. And guess what? Like, I hate it, but now I don't fear being, you know, having someone be disloyal to me anymore. I, of course, have moments where I'm like, I, I get worried, but I remind myself that, look, if someone does break my trust, depends on who and what it is, some things are redeemable and some things are not, right? Like, some things it just depends on damage control it depends on what you did right some things are fixable some things are not and i can't trust you 100 percent, but i can trust that i can get out of it and that's because i know that allah subhanahu wa has helped me get out of this plenty of times before and when you get to that mindset 
things change. So it's like you don't hold on and cling on to people, which is going to be my next lesson. It's really hard to let people go until you do it and then you wonder why you didn't do it sooner. And this isn't like shade or being salty or being bitter towards anybody or anything like that. Just in general, I say this for everything. I say this for situations. I've said this for years and years and years. I'm pretty sure I've said this in some of my beginning episodes that I released when I used to like record in my closet, okay? Like three years ago. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is let go. But then once you do it, you wonder why you didn't do it sooner. You wonder why you didn't set yourself free earlier. I remember I once said in this episode how we love birds, right? Like, I I love a good bird. I love birds. And, like, you know how people keep pet birds? I'm like, why do... And I always think this. And I remember I said this in an episode. I said, I'm like, why do people keep pet birds? Like, why do you keep a bird locked up in a cage? How is that fun? How is that fun for the bird? How is that fun for you? That's just my opinion. And I just feel like when you love something, you set it free, right? And so... I know it's a real analogy, but like when you love something, you set it free. So it's like, I feel like some things are like that. Some things are like birds, okay? Some things are like that. Like if you love something, you set it free. Like people that keep like different things, like as animals, like I I get a cat. I had like eight cats before I found out I was allergic to them. Sad story for another day. Not for today. Not for today. Well, actually, let me tell you. Mm, I can't actually. It's one of those stories that actually stinks every time because well, you know what? It's a long story, guys. Let me tell y'all. Intermission. So one time in my, where this was where I used to live, a stray cat came and like we just all fell in love and like she was the sweetest girl and I'm pretty sure she was somebody's like home cat before because she was just mm, she was so well mannered. Anywho, she basically long story short had kids a lot of times, like a lot, like too many times, and um, then we had like eight cats and they used to just. Mm, I was so attached to them and then one day this was uh, this is a series of events I had a hard time breathing and I think it was also in Ramadan and a hard time breathing a lot of things was going on I thought I got COVID I went to the hospital and like I feel like at first I, I forgot they didn't say much they did do a bunch of COVID tests on me and like it was fine I did a COVID rapid test at the pharmacy too and it was fine and then eventually like I, I remember I went to the hospital that night they took so many blood samples da 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 you know my parents were running shifts in the hospital like oh my god hair I can't breathe what's going on eventually they sent me to you know an asthma and allergy specialist and then yeah basically long story short she does like a bunch of different tests on me and like i was allergic to a bunch of different stuff but the main thing i was allergic to was cats like cat fur and all that and and she was like so do you have any cats and my mom she did the 180 swivel she went "Mm," and she gave me the side eye and i was like yep that's the end of that and that was so now it's always like one of those bittersweet things whenever i see like pictures of my cats and i'm like babies i miss you anywho where do we how do we get here how do we get here um pigeons right i was talking about pigeons and birds pigeons scare me is that just me y'all i'm getting on intermission i'm running on low brain cells today anywhere so um long story short um you don't know if you can trust somebody you just have to trust yourself and trust that you'll get out of it and if you see that something has hit the rocks then you know like think about leaving Letting go is the hardest thing until you do it. And then you wonder why you didn't do it sooner. Some things set you free. Some opening up some windows gives you fresh air. I know sometimes you might think you want to trap and keep something. You might want to like hold on to something. But Allah has something a lot better for you on the other side of you resist of your of your resistance right like i always say this this will be my next lesson look at how it's flowing in today flowing in on a real note resistance kills relationships i'm telling you firsthand i'm telling you resistance is going to kill resistance does i understand that in some cases we all want to you know idolize a beautiful middle stance and make this middle stance more rational and more fair and be like well you know middle ground we can both come to terms and meet on this we idolize a middle ground very often and it's like a moral superiority thing they're like look let's just both meet in the middle and put our things aside but sometimes that's just not how it's gonna work i read a quote that said virtue is not synonymous with neutrality sometimes integrity demands a choice and that's what i'm saying sometimes there comes a time in some things where look maybe we can meet in the middle and then sometimes there's 
there's something you just can't, right? Um, and I feel like growing up, I also idolized a middle ground a lot. I was like, we can make any relationship work if we have a middle ground. And you should be understanding and you should have a middle ground. And I agree, there could be a middle ground. A lot of things could be solved by middle ground. But when a middle ground forces you to put away who you are and your identity and your whole self and you feel like you're walking on eggshells because you want to keep someone in your life but you wanted to agree to a middle ground, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. You know how they say that peace is the most expensive thing and if something damages or harms your peace, it's it's already costing you too much? Yes. If there's anything that I've learned in my life, it's that. I'm telling you, you can love something, you can care for something, and maybe you do really want to have that better moral ground and be, you know, in the middle. And I get it. I get it. I really do. And as from somebody who, like, I used to be a really big people pleaser, and even now sometimes I struggle with it, but just kind of, like, making sure I always keep everyone else happy around me, whether that comes at the cost of my unhappiness. And you know when you say stuff like this, people want to demonize you and be like, oh, you're so harsh, you're so this, you're so that. But this is why I'm telling you that resistance kills relationships, because let me tell you why. While there is an equal amount of resistance on both sides of somebody saying, I want it my way, and someone else says they want it their way, and yeah, maybe coming to a middle ground would be better, and in most cases... I will always support, and I'm telling you right now, coming to a middle ground on some things is better. But for some things, you should not come to a middle ground. Sometimes, like I said in our previous lesson, it's better to let go than to come to a middle ground. Because some middle grounds are not middle grounds. They're grounds where you walk on eggshells and compromise who you are, suppress your true identity, dub, just dumb down your personality, you who you are, to come in this middle ground and make other people happy. That's not a middle ground. A middle ground is not a ground where you are paying the costs every day and they're living a lot better about it. I'm sorry. And I know that people don't like to say this because, again, like people, they demonize you. and They're like, oh, my God, you're so, you know, ununderstanding or you're, you lack empathy. But sometimes you have to have empathy for yourself. And some middle grounds take out that empathy for yourself because you're so stoned on and committed to just wanting to keep somebody in your life or wanting to do something to make someone else happy that you'll come to the middle ground. And that middle ground still has resistance. Some things have resistance. Some things you can't get through. Some things, they teach you that you have to part your ways with somebody. Some things teach you that, okay, we can overcome this and we're a lot stronger. Middle grounds are not always bad. Like I said, you can come to middle ground and if it's a both mutual, you know, consent Census where you know this is what I do this is what you do and we work on it that's one thing but it's another thing and I see this happen to women more often where women say Wait, it's a middle ground but they're depressed and sad and they feel like they're walking on eggshells every day that's not a middle ground a middle ground is not a ground when you're unhappy and everything that you wanted is out of the window to make someone else happy that's not middle ground now, on another note, there's some things that I think this applies to, very big, serious things where, you know, it's it's like the relationship can work or it can't work. Like, for example, let me tell you something. Um, theoretically, I have a friend whose husband does some things that he shouldn't be doing, right? Whether that's alcohol, whatever, vice versa, whatever, for example, right? And on the same note, I know a lot of women that have also gotten married in these weird conditions like this where their family has been like, Look, he might not be the best guy, but we promised their family when you were a lot younger that you're going to marry him. Or he might not be the best guy, but you can fix him. He, not, he might not be the best guy, but he just needs time, right? And then it's like this whole awkward contingency where everybody's like, come to the middle. Come on, make everybody happy. If you say yes, all of our families will be happy. He'll be happy. If you say yes, things will be better. But are you happy? Are you happy with the fact that you might have to live with somebody who's an alcoholic, who might be an abuser? Well, it makes my parents happy. And my parents don't agree. They're just resisting on what they want. His family's resisting on what they want. And I want something else, right? I'm sorry. There's no middle ground here. The, the middle ground is that y'all going to tussle it out and I'm going to leave. That's it. That's the middle ground. Middle ground is you want to deal with it, go ahead. But I'm going to leave. And that's how things at times should be. At times, you have to be... You have to have some resistance. Resistance does kill relationships in some cases. And the reason why I said that is because then there comes little things. Little, little things that are minuscule, everyday things. Things that are not that big of a deal. Things that we can come and agree on. Things that we can sort out but we choose not to because we're not being understanding, right? That is when resistance, that buildup kills relationships. The, the buildup starts to get worse and worse. Now, for example, theoretically small example, if I told you that you're going to do the dishwasher from now on and you're like, no, you're going to do it. And me and you are just like mm, set on stone. We have resistance that you're going to do the dishwasher. I'm not going to do it. The dishwasher is just not going to get done. And that resistance is going to pile on. The next day, you know, you say to me that you're going to do the laundry from now on. I'm like, no, I'm not. I hate doing it. You're going to do it from now on. 
and we're just both resisting on the fact that we're not going to do it. It looks like a little thing on the surface, laundry, dishwasher. The next day becomes, you know, you're going to change the kid or you're going to do that. It, resistance adds on and it kills relationships because then you feel like you're not being heard. And that's important because everyone wants to feel heard. I feel like it's important to come to a middle ground in some things and, you know, work it out, talk it out, and make compromises. And like I said, love requires sacrifices. If you're not willing to do that, don't sacrifice. Don't fall in love. But at the same exact time, there are some things that I feel like we put under a broad general term, especially for girls. We're like, well, just compromise. Just deal with it. Just put up with it. Just come to middle ground. And there's some things that you do have to be resistant on. Some relationships have to die. That's it. Some relationships have to die. And if your resistance kills a relationship that's not good for you, that requires you to walk on eggshells and be on the middle ground, and that's making you unhappy, the middle ground is more over for them, not for you, I'm then, okay, hello, like, it's gonna die. That's it. And I get it, like, this might sound complicated to some people, and I know it might sound like I'm kind of contradicting myself in one sen sentence or the other, but it really is situational, right? Little things, little things, little things build up to be big things. But when we have big decisions, we have big things, we have, you know, things that are going to detrimental life and death affect you, right? Like you can't just say, mm, here's the middle ground. You come to it, especially when the middle ground is just in favor of somebody else. The middle ground doesn't favor you. A lot of times people try to set up a middle ground that favors them and doesn't favor you. And then they try to make you look like the bad guy. You look like the evil person who doesn't compromise. You're not evil for not compromising on something that you know will make you unhappy or will keep you walking on eggshells or will dumb down your personality and will keep you unsettled. I know a lot of women that got married in loveless marriages and they thought that it was going to happen and love was going to happen and they're going to grow and things are going to change. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. And they regret it now. And they're like, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I was just resistant. I wish that this thing would have just died out on its own and I would have left because the middle ground wasn't middle for me. It was a very short end of the stick. And so that's what I'm saying. Resistance, At sometimes you're going to have to learn how to use it. I had some people message me a few times. Not even a few. I see this every week almost. Where they tell me that their family's forcing them to get married to somebody they don't want to get married to. Right? That's concerning. And already Islamically you know, a forced marriage, that's not something we necessarily consider valid. So then this is where you got to be resistant that I'm not going to do this. And if it happens that mm, the relationship dies between me and whoever's supposed to get married to or things just don't work out, then whoopsies. I'm sorry, but this is my decision, right? I also know so many girls who unfortunately don't necessarily have I guess you could say the same amount of resources and accesses and so their family has forced them to set up men and just people they don't want to get married to and their family's like well why don't you compromise and come to a middle ground you marry him and we'll be happy and you know we will will be will not be mad at you anymore that's not a middle ground you're telling a girl to give up her entire life her entire dreams everything go marry some person she doesn't want to marry and then you'll be happy that's not a middle ground Let's learn what a middle ground means. Because too many times when you don't agree to a middle ground, you're the one who looks like a bad person. You're the one that looks like an evil person. But sometimes some middle grounds are not middle grounds. They're just there to set you up. And again, I'm not saying that the relationships in your life intend on doing this, right? Not necessarily. Not all the people in your life intend on it. But at times, it's convenient. And it kind of happens. Things happen. That's life, right? And so like I said, you need to understand when to use resistance and when to not. Because if you put down resistance too fast, right? Like if you just agree to every single thing that your parents say, haram or halal, or if, you know, your parents want you to go do a haram business and you don't have any resistance against that, like that's a problem. You need resistance and you need to learn when to use it and when to not. And you also need to learn what a middle ground means. This was a little bit mumble jumble and it does kind of contradict, but I think it depends on what si what your situation is, right? Because I can't give you a one size fit all. In some situations, I believe personally, like I said, I'm a very understanding person. I believe that there's a lot of understanding and empathy that goes in relationships. And I believe that that's important. And I believe it's important to come to a middle ground at times. But at another time, if you see that something is sacrificing your entire life, life and death, unhappiness, da 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 da, um, abuse, like there's no middle ground there. And like that, I remember this quote that I just said to you guys earlier, virtue's not synonymous with neutrality. Sometimes integrity demands a choice. So sometimes things do demand a choice. And that's that. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you is this. Earlier on, earlier on in the episode, I mentioned to you guys how I said like there was three times in my life where I like really got like hurt. And I was like, oh my God, like what am I going to do about it? Right. Where I, like it hit me to rock bottom. And those three times were never like by the same person or consecutively at the same time. I remember one of them was, I think, four years ago. Another one was 
probably two, three years after that. So it was at a different time in my life. It's never been consecutively same time, same person. No. Some of those people I don't even live near anymore, right? So it's like really far apart at a very young age in my life. Some of them a little older, but thing is I haven't forgotten them, right? And that's, that's because things, when you hit rock bottom that way, you remember that. And that's what I'm saying. I think it's important to remember at times that people might hurt you or someone might love you, whatever it is. But how someone treats you rarely has a lot to do with you and your worth, okay? Um, I think the term rarely is even wrong. I think it has nothing to do, actually. Because a lot of times, what happens is we correlate the way people treat us. We correlate the way people do wrong with us with, you know, how how worthy we are or how pretty we are or any of those things. And I feel like it has nothing to do with that. It really doesn't. And y'all know that. Y'all know that already. I've talked about this a lot before. The way that somebody treats you doesn't define your worth. Cliche, but it's very true. Because a lot of times, how people treat you is a very big reflection of who they are inside. I know you guys have heard that too. Very cliche. But it really is. I would never treat you like a horrible person. I wouldn't run you over, do horrible things, gaslight, manipulate you. And, you know, be like, well, I'm the one who's sane in the relationship. Lord, that don't sound sane. That don't sound right. Right? And so it's like, that has a lot to do with my own inner workings on how I perceive life. I think the way that you perceive life, the way you perceive things, they impact the way you treat people. So perceive well and treat people well. That's very important. But if someone treats you poorly, it doesn't have anything to do with you. I'm telling you that from somebody who's like, those three times were like the hardest rock bottoms of my life. And I never forgot them because even though some of them was when I was like a preteen, I still remember it. And I'm like 20. So those things, they don't leave. They don't leave. But they teach you things. And I can promise you that every betrayal, every leave, every rock bottom, it makes you so much more stronger. And you find so much more peace eventually within you and yourself that is just out of this world. I want to wrap off one more lesson. And this one is going to be a heavy one. And this one might, you know, get some people angry. But I'm going to say what I think. This is not something I have been through or something I have faced necessarily. But this is something that I've seen a lot of people talk to me about. And I've seen a lot of my listeners talk to me about this. Which is why I'm going to throw this last one in. But I have heard a lot about this also from my close friends. So, potential, right? The potential you see in relationships. The potential you see in people. The potential you see in what you think your life will look like with them. Okay? With all due respect, kill it. (laughs) Kill every bit of a potential expectation that you see in them, that you see them providing in your life, that you see coming in your life as a benefit of them. Kill it. I'm going to tell you one thing that changed my entire life, okay? It goes among the lines of the potential you see in other people isn't real. It's the projection of what you would do if you were in their position. Okay, and that's really important to remember because at times you are so hooked on and attached to the potential of what you think they can provide you or what, how you even think your own life is going to change, how you think you're going to develop and just mm, become on cloud nine and become happier and better and just the potential of what you see in them and what you think that they should be doing is often what you would do if you were them. You want them to go above and beyond and be loyal, be consistent and, you know, just give you flowers every day. I don't even know. Or if it's even your parents, like you want them to talk to you this way, treat you this way and give you this type of love. And you're like, they have that potential. Maybe they do. But at the end of the day, we don't live in an imaginary world. I don't run myself based off of what I think you can do for me. Cause at the core of it all, it, it matters on what you have done for me, right? That's all that matters. What you say you're going to do for me or what you, what I think you're going to do for me has nothing to do with what you've actually done for me right? Because like you can promise me a hundred things. And I've said this a lot of times before. I don't really believe promises. You can promise me a hundred things and say a hundred things to me. But until you do it, that's when I'm going to believe it, right? And so the potential you see in other people often isn't real. You've imagined it in your mind. This is what you think this person is capable of doing. This is what you think this person should be doing. And that's probably what you would have done if you were them. And I get it. Like it's sweet. You think well of this person. You imagine a really good reality with this person. You really love this person. You think well of them. And you like who they are. But that doesn't change the fact that what you are daydreaming about or your potential you think they have or the way that you expect your life to be if you have them, that still doesn't exist. There's a difference between what is existing now and what isn't. 
reality and imagination. And what is in reality is what this person is in front of you. And that might be a really good person, and that might be a really bad person, each to their own. Whatever it is, that is what it is. It is what it is that's in front of you. This is all you have, okay? So for you to live in a potential and hold on because you believe that there is a certain potential that you are just going to bring out of this person is delusional and it's foolish and it's going to get you hurt before you ever see that potential. Because again, that potential is what you would have done. You want this person to show up for you this way. You want them to love you this way or you want your parents to support you this way. You want your parents to do this for you. And a lot of times I know Deep down, maybe you're like, but I see the potential of them doing this for me. They can do this for me. Yes, they can, but are they? You know what I'm saying? Like, are they? And you're like, well, if I was them, I would. Exactly. There you go. You proved your own point. Like, so many times I've talked to girls who are like, but if I was a parent, I would do this. Or if I was him, I'd do this. If I was my sister, I would do this. But you're not them. You're not them they are them you get what i'm saying like that's them that's them you are you you don't get to control how people what people do and just because you would do something doesn't mean they will i have a lot of things that i think i'd do if i was a parent that my parents don't do that doesn't mean what my parents are doing is is bad or mine is better i'm just saying that we have different opinions i have some situations where i've had friends say to me but if i was a parent i would never treat you know my kids the way my parents treat me but you're not a parent and they are And that's what I'm saying. You see this potential or at times you think to yourself, if I was them, I wouldn't do that. And yeah, maybe you won't. Maybe you won't grow up and treat your kids like that. Maybe you won't do that. I get it. But at the core of it all, what it is is still in front of you. And when it comes to outside of family, because in family, it's a little trickier. You can't just cut off your family. That's not how life works, right? Um, Outside of family this potential and if I was them this is what I would do is going to drive you in a very vicious cycle where you're never going to be satiated you're never going to be satisfied and you're never going to be happy because you're going to constantly hold on and think that if I tell them enough or if I think about how what I would do in their position enough or believe that they have a potential and think that I could take it out of them things are going to change they are not okay I appreciate, and I bet they probably do appreciate too, that you're probably a really loyal person and you're really loving and you probably see good potential in them and that's very sweet, but that's not what they are, okay? Potential and reality are two different things and while you might do those things for you, they themselves in that body are not doing it and that's really all that matters. Now, this was a heavy episode and like I said, no shade, no tea going on here. This is just life lessons that I feel like you learn one way or another from people or just hearing or just going through it your own self or just in general. Um, But inshallah, I hope this episode benefited you in some way and taught you something and taught you kind of a better way to go about life and go about your relationships because I think relationships are a really sensitive thing I think that there is a lot of love and empathy and patience that goes into them but we also need to be aware and be focused on when things are going in a way that is just harming you and nobody else right you don't want to be the one that's trying to save somebody from drowning and you end up drowning you know what I'm saying and so you kind of have to be Awake and be focused on each and every single relationship in your life. But I also want to mention one more thing. That every relationship requires an immense amount of patience, right? No one's going to be perfect. No one's going to be absolutely amazing. No one's going to be flawless. Things require patience. Patience is very different than gaslighting, manipulation, abuse, you know, crying yourself to sleep every night, throwing up because you're losing weight. It looks very different than, you know, girls, you going in the shower and you're seeing your hair is shedding because you're just so stressed. It looks very different than you having to suppress all your goals or not reaching your goals or being super unproductive in your life, you know, because you're just so hung on and stuck on and in pain and you call that patience. That's not patience. Patience doesn't require you to completely diminish who you are to keep someone happy patience doesn't require you to lose a sense of identity and your goals to keep someone else happy too many people try to try to play those two one-on-one and merge them together and say patience is hard and it requires things of course it is it is hard and it does require a lot of effort but it doesn't require you to diminish you or you to put yourself down to make someone else happy if the only time someone else is someone else is happy is by putting you down or when you are below you have a very 
big problem. And you need to first sort within yourself what does it mean to be patient and what does it mean to have effort in your relationships. Effort is very different than putting up with abuse, than putting up with, you know, being manipulated and da-da-da-da. Effort doesn't look like you crying yourself to sleep every night or biting your tongue, making sure that you say nothing to harm the other person so you can be okay. That's not what effort looks like. Effort doesn't look like you sucking it all up and bottling it up because you think that as long as you stay silent, it's going to be okay. If you have to stay silent just for things to be okay, if you have to suppress your emotional needs just for things to be okay, you are in a very big problem. Do not sugarcoat this with efforts or patience. We are out of the time of patience. This is It gets dangerous from there. Honestly, it gets really dangerous. And like I said, all relationships require patience and effort. And you see those things and you see the way that those are nurtured in a healthy relationship and it's very different than the way that you might see in a toxic or negative relationship. So learn the difference. And the final thing I want to say is that every single relationship in our life, whether we love them, whether we hate them, whether they're with us, whether they have left us, I like to look at them and think that they're a mercy from Allah. Every single human being in their own shape or form somehow was a mercy and somehow was sent to me from Allah for a reason. Now, I might not, you know, necessarily love or agree or still be with this person or have this person in my life. Or maybe I do love them. Maybe they are with me. But in every single case, alhamdulillah. Because if they're gone, they've taught you something. And I know that you hate hearing that. I know people hate hearing, well, they didn't have to do all that because the pain was so much. But that pain makes you so much more stronger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a reason for sending every single person in your life. Maybe it hurts right now. It sucks. You don't enjoy it. I know. But every single betrayal makes you stronger. Every single person who comes in your life makes you stronger. Every single person in your life right now who loves you makes you stronger. Right? So it goes both ways. Alhamdulillah for everyone who has come, who has left. Every single person, I say this myself genuinely, every single person who is in my life and who hasn't or is not in my life anymore, I genuinely wish well for all of them. I make dua equivalently for all of them. And I don't say that to sound like a superior, you know, high complex type of individual who's sounding no arrogant. No, because I know how hard it is at times to do things that... Your body might not want you to do, right? Like, I, it's probably really hard for you to make dua for someone who's hurt you. But when you do it, it's like you kind of conquer your nafs and you get a little bit ahead of that. And you get a level up and you're like, look, I'm, I'm a lot better than just sitting here and wishing bad on somebody. I'm wishing them well. And that's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me this person and now they're gone. That's okay. And I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of them, right? And then the people that are in your life, of course, make well dua for them and, you know, Wish them all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases love between you and your family and you and your friends and whatnot that way. Make dua for them. But moreover, remember that these relationships, good and bad, are something Allah has sent in your life, right? And in one way or another, they might not look like a mercy from Allah. But if they turn you back to Allah and if they make you get closer to Allah, then this was a beautiful, beautiful test that's worth enduring. It's it's something that's going to give you good reward. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, people that have done horrible things to you, that have abused you or whatever, is just excusable and, you know, the end. That's not how it works. But what I am saying is that, to your best degree, always try to forgive people. Always. And I always say this. People that are in your life and people that have left. Because I always say this again, cliche, but forgiveness really does set you free more than anything else. They might not need your forgiveness. They might not care. But it sets you free from holding on to that. Anyway... I know I kind of mumble jumbled in this episode. It's been a pretty tiring week, but I hope you guys kind of got the gist of what I'm saying. Remember that everything is situational. These are not like one set fit all for everything. Everything requires different advice, different applications. Um, and I understand that, you know, it's different for everybody. Anyway, take care of yourself. Have a great rest of your day. Asalaamu Alaikum.